Welcome to another episode of Silicon Minds Human Hearts. Today we're we with Finat, who's the director of Azure AI Services. Finat, thank you very much for joining us today. Great to be here. I'm always excited to talk about what's going on in the world of AI. So there's a lot going on, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Every day. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah. Could you please introduce yourself? What do you do specifically at Microsoft and how does your day to day job look like? Um, sure. So, hi, I'm Vinod. Uh, I started, you know, I actually started my career at Microsoft a long time ago, uh, worked in a bunch of different startups and involved and got involved in the AI space maybe about 12 or 15 years ago, originally through computer vision. And so there's a lot of interesting lessons there. Um, I rejoined Microsoft just about a year ago, and within Microsoft, I currently run uh, several different uh, AI products. And so notably, um, Azure AI Search, which is our uh, search and retrieval system, most often used for retrieval augmented generation and things like that with LLMs, uh, and as well as a bunch of our specialized models. So language, speech, vision, um, some of our database interfaces, and so on. Okay. Many of those products have seen lately a lot of changes. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. How how do you how do you keep up with all those changes as a director? Oh, I mean, first of all, like I you know, I, I very explicitly, especially and especially in the last three or four years, I very explicitly set aside a good chunk of my mornings and a good chunk of my evenings to do nothing but read papers, follow the Twitter feeds and so on. And it's really the only way to do it. Like you it needs to be a part of your daily work life is just keeping up with all the latest and greatest. Um, you know, I'd say, you know, even with all the people and product responsibilities and so on, I probably make it a goal to read five to 10 of the research papers a week. Um, and based on what of those five, you know, so I have a whole process for how to identify which five or 10 are worth reading. And then of those five to 10, I figure I have a process for figuring out which two or three I maybe forward out to the rest of my team and say, Hey guys, this is something you guys need to be on top of as well. Um, and, and so it's, still it's miss... pretty systematic. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Still you miss some things. <laughs> still definitely miss. And there's just such a huge volume. Um, I mean, I don't know. If you look at things like just in the space of like retrieval augmented generation rag, there are probably, I don't know, two or three worthy research papers published a week just on that topic, right? And that's just staying on top of what's going on in research even before you start getting into the funnel of, okay, well, we've identified a promising research trajectory which one of these things are we going to take from R and into D, into development, and actually make it a part of our product in the future? Uh, you have already quite a career path. How did you get into AI? Um, I mean, my so my original entree in AI, like I was saying, was through the computer vision angle, maybe about twelve to fifteen years ago. Um, and at that time, you know, you know, I started my career at Microsoft a long time ago, working in the early days of Windows, early days of the web, and so on. Um, what often did a bunch of different startups, and I was kind of in between startups and. One of our, you know, a common friend of mine, as well as this particular team, um, is an investor. He's a seed stage investor in a bunch of different startups. He's like, hey, why don't you go and lend some of your time and energy uh, to this really bright group of people that had spun out of Georgia Tech and Disney Imagineering. And they had done really interesting creative work for Disney theme parks in the realm of computer vision. And he said, they're trying to figure out how to productize what they're working on. Uh, can you get involved with them and just kind of, you know, spend some time? And that turned into basically a full-time job with that group um, in, you know, at a very pivotal moment of computer vision. I mean, I, you know, computer vision was kind of one of the first domains that AI really transformed. And I was working with a team right at the midst of that kind of AI transformation, right? The original forms of computer vision, you know, pre-deep learning and so on were based on things like really exotic feature detection algorithms to figure out, you know, to find human faces or human hands and so on inside of a picture. AI came in and deep learning came in a particular and just swept the whole field um, and completely transformed how do we do things like you know, image analysis, video analysis, and so on. Um, and so between computer vision and then, of course, natural language and so translation, transformers, and so on were also some of the earliest um, domains. You know, I, I was lucky to have a very early role or early seat at the table in watching AI kind of transform how we do all these other different computer science tasks. Okay. Now you're responsible for a couple of products on the AI stack, you could say, on the Microsoft AI stack. Maybe a tricky question, but which one is your most favorite? Nah. <laughs> it's, hard. <laughs> it's hard to pick just one. I mean, each one, each one has a different, um, each one has a has a different role or a different place. I Man, I think one of the ones that we, uh, you know, maybe one of the ones that's probably been most transformed by AI is search. You know, like classic computer science or search. Yeah, you know, search has been a domain in computer science for like 40 or 50 years, right? It predates everything. One of the earliest things um, 
you know, that some of the biggest names in computer science um, were focused on. And so, yeah, there was originally this problem of information retrieval, you know, maybe 20 to 30 years ago, all the energy and information retrieval went into web search. And, you know, what was the cutting edge of information retrieval? Well, it's whatever Google shipped or whatever Bing had shipped that week. Um, in the last two to three years, information retrieval has really been transformed again by large language models. And so LLM's first change, how do we do information retrieval? It's like all the internals of a search stack, for example, have been transformed by LLMs. You know, we went from classic stuff like PageRank uh, to now semantic ranking and different forms of uh, AI-based ranking. Um, and you know, maybe about two to three years ago, we saw a big new use case emerge for search, which is um, retrieval augmented generation or RAG with LLM. So how do you take your private internal data and seed it to a language model to do um, you know, custom tasks, custom tools? Um, I think we're on the cusp of yet another one of these transformations. I mean, we are already seeing, you know, you know, agents is the big hot new word and big hot new domain for AI in 2025. And we're already starting to see agentic rag and agents even becoming a first class consumer of search results. And so you were on the verge of yet another transformation where we go from the purpose of search was to feed humans or feed L, you know, feed data to LLMs who would then turn for uh, feed humans to, oh, wow maybe the single biggest use case of search might be to actually feed data to machines or feed data to agents and then let them go crazy and you know solve problems for us and so on. No, oh, that's quite an interesting mm -hmm. one. Um, yeah, and that's just one. Like There's a similar story or similar transformations going on uh, with language, with speech, with vision, um, and so on. And so it's a pretty exciting time. If you look at the startup scene here, specifically here in San Francisco mm -hmm. or the Bay Area, there's still a lot of startups that really focus on search databases, uh, search engines. It means there's still a lot of work on it. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, search is one of these foundational capabilities. Like search is, um, you know, it, like there's many, many products or many, many services that just under the covers are actually a search problem. Like things like recommendations, uh, which are everywhere, right? Every single consumer product, certainly, you know, from TikTok to, you know, you name it, you know, dating apps and so on are all variations of this recommendations problem, which in turn is a special case of the search problem, right? It's just basically, I've got a big pool of potential things I can feed you. And just how do I sort and sift through that field or that pool and feed certain ones to you, things to you first? And so search is one of the things that it, it, it percolates up in many, many different places, many, many different ways. Um, and so it's not surprising that there are dozens of startups that are all vertical variations of how do you take that search idea, um, and in particular, this latest iteration of the search idea, LLMs, um, and apply it to all these different verticals. Um, you know, within Microsoft, of course, we're building out a very horizontal system, right? We're, we're you know, my team in particular, it's very focused on broad-based enterprise use cases and in particular enterprise developer use cases. Um, and so that means that we have a particular approach uh, to how we solve search problems which is a little bit different from a lot of these different startups, for example. You you just mentioned enterprise organizations. Any mm -hmm. particular ideas that you've seen being set up by some of your customers? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, this is pretty cool. I didn't thought about that being oh, interesting within our with our tools. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, we're definitely seeing yeah, you know, like within enterprise. I think with the enterprise software broadly, like the financial services sector is some crazy percentage. I mean, maybe a third of all, you know, the IT globally is like a multi-trillion dollar business. Maybe a third of that is all spent by these financial services firms. And so the amount of crazy stuff that they have budget and ROI and impetus and skill and teams and so on to go after um, is always amazing. Um, you know, I mean, like, like a couple of years ago, yeah, I would say a couple, maybe ten or fifteen years ago, it was a it was considered a kind of a crazy thing that these initial wave of hedge funds and trading firms, um, you know, were building up these big AI bots. Like this is way before anybody else was doing it, but they were building and deploying this stuff at scale. They're building up these big pools of AI bots that were doing nothing but just reading the news and using news feeds to kind of guess sentiment and you know look for that tiny bit, of, you know, slightest little bit of insight into a stock or a company or a new CEO being hired, or a new executive moving to a different firm, and immediately turning that into a trading signal, or immediately turning into turning that into like a buy or sell order, um, you know, just to get that one little extra scoop on their competitors. And so you see a lot of that, right? You see things that started in financial services as language processing, and even quote unquote agentic behavior 10 or 15 years ago, now starting to percolate through the rest of the industry. And, um, 
I don't know. I mean, you're 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 going to see similar things. I mean, you know, there's really interesting things going on in the healthcare sector. Really interesting things going on in manufacturing and you know, industrials and so on. But I think with healthcare, a lot of well, these kind of services help with research to make things go faster. No, oh, absolutely, absolutely. And and people are still it's still you know I think there was like a famous Andrew Ng quote. I don't know, maybe six or seven years ago, where he said, "Hey, there's no you know in six or seven years the world's not going to need radiologists." Uh, and it turned out to be the exact opposite, right? Like, you know, I, I literally have a relative who just finished radiology residency and he's got a complete buyer's market in terms of how many opportunities and options he have. And they're all instances of AI augmenting his radiology skills as opposed to replacing. And so it's hard to predict, you know, e even things that seem very linear or seem very direct or very obvious. It's hard to predict what happens when these things actually percolate out into the economy and into the job market. So, well, think job market wise we're gonna see differences over the couple of years how what's your idea about that um i mean i think the safest one and this is yeah you know, I, I wish you could take credit for it but it's you know definitely a meme that's out there the safest one is like your your job's not gonna get replaced by ai you're gonna be replaced by somebody else who's using ai right and so i think it's yeah you, know, it, you know it's just like the total number of financial analysts employed went up as a result of Microsoft Excel and spreadsheet applications and programs, you know, percolating their way through the economy. You know, yes, book, you know, there's, there's probably a class of bookkeepers who didn't kind of survive the transition, but the total number of bookkeepers employed by the economy went up 10 to 20 X, right? Not, it didn't shrink. Um, and so, the, you know, there's different names for this, like, you know, Jeevan's paradox or Say's law and so on, where when the cost of certain inputs comes way down, and in this case, the cost of a class of intelligence comes way down. Um, the demand rises sometimes accordingly, or even uh, in you know, in excess of that cost reduction. Um, and so it's hard to predict. It's very very hard to predict. But am I right to say that people will need to reskill? There will be some. I mean, it's similar to the initial waves of computers and so on sweeping the workforce. Uh, yeah, you know, it was it was a. There was a set of skills associated with being a good bookkeeper and keeping your, you know, keeping your tables in line, keeping your spreadsheets, you know, paper spreadsheets kind of running. And then there was a different set of skills that came with knowing how to work Excel and knowing all the shortcut keys and how to form, create a formula uh, and so on. Um, and then especially as all this stuff, you know, when all this stuff moved from being paper to PCs, it was one thing. And it went from being PCs to networked PCs and PCs where the spreadsheet is like a centrally managed doc and as a multi-user document. All these things were kind of differences and changes in how we, in this case, performed the bookkeeping function. Yeah. So in the future, when the IRS comes to check your bookkeeping, we can just ask an agent, yeah. like, <laughs> exactly. I just answer the questions he, he's asking. Yeah, we're probably not that far from that. Yeah, <laughs> where the, yeah, the bookkeeping or the IRS agent will basically ask <laughs> your personal agent yeah. for that data. Yeah. <laughs> now, one last question I like to ask people is, there's a lot of AI tools in our day-to-day -day life. What particular one do you enjoy using that is something that's just built in the services that we use? Yeah. I mean, you know, the the one that immediately comes to mind is DJX on Spotify. Okay. I just, you know, I just drove in, in uh, for this interview and DJX kept me wonderfully entertained. In fact, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is a good example of like, it used to be the commute was the worst part of my day. And because I know that DJX almost always does a great job on Spotify, that a commute has actually turned into one of my favorite parts of the day because it is the one time especially with two children, <laughs> I actually get to control my audio environment. So it's your personal uh, radio station. <laughs> personal radio station that I don't have to share with my kids. Right? <laughs> exactly. Well, I think that's a great end for this conversation. Thank you very much for your time, Vinod. We're looking forward to the updates that are coming and the new Microsoft AI services. And I wish you all the best with, uh, with your career. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it so much. So.